There is a rare moment we get to experience where the collective pop culture consumer conscience rears its attention to the same piece of work at the exact same time. These fleeting emotions are often captured like a photograph and bottled into a title whose name you forever evoke with the memory of these emotions. Aren't I poetic? The Sopranos, Game of Thrones, Stranger Things, Arcane. You can always filter these works of art out by how you describe them. So many films and shows are good and great, and if you ever try to convince someone to watch something you like, we both know those two descriptors just don't cut it, but along comes something of magnitude and you find yourself telling people, you need to watch it, it's a masterpiece. Arcane is a masterpiece. We could spend hours here sucking the juice out of every morsel of brilliance from this show, but what you need to know is simple. Vision is rarely pulled off at this level between all the thousands of people involved in putting something like this together. You feel that every episode, every frame, every scene, and even more impressively, with every character. But none are better delivered than Victor and Vanda. Something in you knows why you like them, but the merit of their writing comes in making you understand how you've taken that for granted and how they challenge every exploration of moral good to come. On paper, Victor and Vanda are both noble characters like so many others to have graced the silver screen, but what puts them head and shoulders above the rest and well into elite territory is the reasoning behind why. Vanda is the de facto leader of the lanes, having established his merit and the respect that is shown him through a mix of combat prowess, delicate touch diplomacy, and strong arm conflict resolution. Vander is trusted and valued by his people because he has ensured the means and the safety they need to prosper in their uniquely undercity way. Whilst far from equal to their Piltover counterparts, Vander makes sure they stick their pompous noses back where they belong, in between their own superior cheeks. I mean, come on. This guy looks like he spends the majority of his day giggling and smelling his own farts. Vanda embodies the past, and that weight is one he carries heavily and brilliantly, as we will see further on. Victor, the prodigious, crippled Zornite scientist who has climbed his way to the highest heights through merit, embodies the future. Modern nobility in media is often accompanied by a very poor attempt and attributing virtue to characters simply for what they represent. The protagonist is good and strong because of course they are, not because they have to be or have chosen to become so. Exposition is rampant in a great majority of creative pieces because it tends to serve a function. We're so often told how to feel about a character or told who they are that we're depraved of the opportunity of getting to know and experience them for ourselves. And yes, I do see the irony of what I'm saying. Anime does this more than other mediums so as to play around with the character reactions, and it's actually quite fun. But we've somehow allowed some real stinkers to fly under the radar. Characters have begun to take on attributes given to them by others, aka being told to us, so that writers can circumvent any necessary development to reach that point. Even more infuriating is seeing a complete lack of these attributes in their actions. So it's truly refreshing when a masterpiece like Arcane comes along and puts in the work elevating the standard via the challenge it implicitly imposes on any future works. Once a Zornite idealist who managed to unite the Undercity under one banner alongside his partner Silco, the brash and dominant brawler Vanda is a changed man. Having led the charge across the bridge to Piltover, Vanda engages in heavy combat with the enforcers. Lives are lost and taken. He knows the deal and is unafraid to flex his prowess brutally. But however comfortable he may be in pursuing his ideals, no matter the bloodshed, 
how does it impact the people he leads, those that look to his guidance? In the face of unimaginable chaos, Vanda does what all good and true leaders do. He faces the responsibility of his actions head on, bravely and honestly. In this context, it means assessing whether or not his ambitions are actually aiding the people he has sworn to liberate. This practice of removing his pride and his goals from view allows him to see the true cost of his actions. In failing to bring about Zorn and choosing instead to protect the lanes, Vander establishes himself as a far better leader and man than the one who led fist first. Sounds contradictory, I know, but let's take a moment to ask ourselves a crucial question. Are we virtuous if we lack the capacity for malice, or if we acknowledge that capacity and choose not to act on it? This idea is by no means new, and those of you familiar with the work of Carl Jung have surely heard of the shadow. For those that haven't, you need only look to Vanda to see the concept incarnate. Through the legend he's built for himself as a fighter to be feared, he doesn't need to resort to violence to solve conflict. In fact, he makes it clear that it would breach his principles, preferring instead a diplomatic approach. In said approach, he's unafraid to speak to people in a cheekier tone because he knows they know better than to try and remove him from the picture. If that were the extent of it, Arcane would have already delivered a really great character. But you see, they take it up another step. Being who he is, having done what he has done, other writers may have portrayed Vander as failed, passive and hesitant. Instead, we see a man who understands the need to express these negative emotions without acting on them. A man who understands the necessity for competence in situations of conflict and not one who runs from them. Most importantly, one who wears his failures on his sleeve and encourages others to learn from them should they be doomed to repeat them. These people I speak of are the very same he's failed. He's not off on some island whimpering and drinking blue milk from an alien teat. Um, Luke Skywalker? He's facing them, helping the very people who may hold something against him. This is the most true with Vi and her gang. Note how he speaks to them. A paternal figure, yes, yet one who makes them learn as equals. If your children can't escape violence, as is blatantly the case in the Undercity, you damn well need to make them aware of its full spectrum. If you ever want to see what a character's arc and themes are, pay close attention to the climactic sequence of their story and the actions they take. Having walked the fine line of safety and freedom he established in tandem with Grayson, Chaos comes a knocking in the form of his old and not so drowned pal Silco, whom he betrayed. Taken hostage, he's confronted by his enraged former partner. To Silco, Vander has committed the heinous crime of betraying the cause. Despite my obvious subjective bias, it's important to appreciate the fact that Vander doesn't put himself on any moral high ground because he knows he has none to stand on. His unwillingness to compromise others for his cause contrasts Silco's, yet he empathizes with his enemy. He doesn't seek forgiveness or redemption, but growth. Unaware of Vi's plan to rescue him, Vander is fully ready to die for his people, thus honoring his code. But when the kids show up, things change. The stakes here couldn't be higher. He's faced with his own death but even then he recognizes that he needs to spring into action. Physically restrained, he puts everything we've mentioned previously into motion, communicating as an equal, leading with a soft touch, heading straight into conflict with the full weight of responsibility. In trying to preserve what he values, Vander engages in a strange paradox. To honor his principle of keeping the lane safe from violence, he needs to be as violent as possible. Throw a little powder into the mix, and things get explosive. 
Reliving his past and tragically noting once more the cost of his own failings, Vander hits his climactic moment, seemingly falling into darkness. And yet, in his last ditch effort to save Vi, he doesn't hesitate to turn himself into the necessary monster capable of meeting the challenge, even if it will ultimately destroy him. Even changed and deformed, the avatar of reckless bloodlust, Vanda still tries to shield Vi from that view, in an attempt to preserve what little innocence she may have left. Given the choice to end Silco's tyranny, or to protect the lanes, Vi, one last time, Vanda makes the most right choice once more, telling you everything you need to know about him with his last breath. This is how you show the weight and importance of nobility. You write characters that do what they say and understand why. But is that all there is to explore? No because a man named Victor has a thing or two to say. This second part of this ballad is on its way. Thank you all again for watching. Look forward to more character video essays on this channel.